You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 168, Coal Chamber. Hosted by Dan Terry. I'm too busy trying to pat Jeff on the shoulder and be like, dude, it's going to be fun. Jeff Kane. Too busy shocking my monkey. And Joseph Wren. That one might get past the censor. I'm not sure, though. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you make your day by shocking the monkey, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is Jeff. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Discuss Metal Podcast. I am your host. Di- oh, wait, wait, wrong one. Yeah, wrong one, dude. Sorry. Oh, man. Sorry. This is all I've been doing for the past two weeks, dude. We have like <laughs> at least three months worth of interviews, like already on Joe's hard drive. It's a good problem to have. I mean, it's a great problem to have. We've got some really cool stuff that I already have on tape, so I can kind of like hint at it, you know, like like people that we've talked to that, that, that we... You know, haven't released the episode yet, but it's on tape, so it's going to happen. You know, like, so, you know, like 36 Crazy Fists, anybody? Yeah, that happened earlier this week. Expect multiple spoilers. Dan has a very hard time remembering what he hasn't talked about, what he has talked about, and what you, the listener, have indeed heard. Well, I mean, I'm going to have to go back to this episode as a reference point to remember which ones to even put out. So, (laughs) you know, I've kind of got that going for us. I'm kidding. We have a spreadsheet. It's great. Only if you use it. Absolutely. That's enough. Well, you know, (laughs) here's the thing, man. I'm just not that smart of a guy. I drive around. I'm a little bit loco. I'm unspoiled, but I drive a big truck. So, I mean, (laughs) that's just where we're at right now. Really, dude? You're not going to pig out about it? I mean, if it, okay, here, here's the deal. We're talking about Cold Chamber, if you hadn't picked that up yet. It's New Metal May, in honor of the Roach Coach podcast. We've had a lot of fun with these so far. You guys already got our first taste of Taproot, and uh, it was kind of a bittersweet taste, I want to say. Well, it started out sweet, ended sour. That's how I would say it went down with Taproot. So basically the life of that band's discography. Yeah. I mean, they were in every other album band. I mean, I don't know what else to do. This uh, buddy of mine at work named Matt, he uh, he listened to the episode the other day and was telling me like, dude, he's like, I had to stop the I had to stop the podcast halfway through and listen to Blue Sky Research and then come back. Yeah, it's Pretty because cool. it's, such, it's a such a good album. Criminally underrated. Oh, I agree. I agree. But hey, we already talked about Taproot. So this week we got some cool stuff for you guys. When it comes to the bands that remind me what it felt like to hear new metal for the first time, Cold Chamber might be on the top of that list. They might be the first band that I listened to where I really grasped the concept of what new metal was supposed to be. Heavily detuned guitars in drop D, rhythm guitar, chug-driven riffs, and a man shrieking and growling like Cookie Monster and occasionally piggy squealing. It's everything Dan loves about Grindcore. Well, I wouldn't say Cookie Monster. I say more like uh, Kermit the Frog. Oh, come on, dude. Metal. You don't think there's some Cookie Monster in Sway? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, it's like if Kermit the Frog decided to, you know, really gruff up his voice a little bit. Now, see, that's weird. That turned into like weird Canadian Kermit the Frog. Can't do. I can't hey. do as good of a Kermit as a Palpatine, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> well, before we pick up our cellos and play some chamber music, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion Podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Hey, all we do love. Oh, let me try that again. That was, I had some vocal fry on that. <laughs> it was good, though. Hey, all we love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. They make me feel good. They make Joe feel good. They make Jeff feel especially good, if you, if you know make what we're getting special. at here. <laughs> yes. Uh, we enjoy those five-star reviews. Keep those coming, guys. And uh, one thing that you guys have been doing lately that I really love is sharing the episodes. Sharing the episodes helps us out immensely so that everybody in your family will eventually have to break down and check out the podcast because you're blasting their Facebook walls with it. While everybody else is out there talking about crazy conspiracies that are virus-related, 
uh, you're going to be giving them some positivity or some negativity in the form of music criticism, which is what's going to get us all through this. Otherwise, you'll go loco. <laughs> yep. What? Very topical, Jeff. Ha, ha, ha. So <laughs> loco. So loco. The roof might be on fire, though. Anyway, over on Facebook, in reference to our Taproot episode, Tyler Fleming says Taproot, criminally underrated, to which some dude named Jeff Kane said that he wholeheartedly agreed with that. Yeah. <laughs> Lee, Lee Rydberg says Taproot was one of the few new metal bands that suckered me in back in the day. I think it was demo songs that became their first album on mp3.com. I stuck around until Blue Sky Research, and I'm not sure what they've done since then. Looking forward to this. Maybe they will surprise me like Il Nino and have eight more albums than I thought. Spoiler uh, alert, they don't. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, Blue Sky Research is a very good getting off point. I mean, I could definitely get off to Blue Sky Research. I do. There it is. Andrew Steen on Twitter says, This coffee with Cal is awesome. Like that Discuss Metal podcast with a plea for Andy awesome. I don't know if that was directly referencing the Discuss Metal podcast with Andy Adkins, but it is in my mind. Hey, man, we all got to drink our coffee. We all got to party on forever, and we can only do that if we drink our coffee. So bear that tip in mind. We got a YouTube comment from Jason McQueen in regards to episode 141, Extol with Not Beneath. Yes, Extol's first show was Texas Rockfest 98. I missed it because I was in the Air Force at the time. They were invited to Cornerstone by Lament, if I recall. Lament, that's uh, that's kind of a deep reference. I'm I'm totally into Lament. Uh, I think Jeff would like them too. I'll have to, I'll have to have to show you some of their stuff. They they started off as like a melodic death metal band, but not like not like a mellow death band or like a, a Gothenburg band, but like just a death metal band that played melodic music. And eventually they went off into uh, kind of more like prog territory, like more chill stuff. Um, okay. Jeff, can't, Jeff can't resist a combination like that. No, I can't. <laughs> That's the truth. Finally, we got a comment from Satanic Puppy Overlord in regards to Amazing. episode 165, Immortal Souls. Winter, Immortal Souls? Why not just listen to Immortal? I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, I don't know. I guess if you're really into mellow death, you would check out Immortal Souls first. But if you're into just like black metal, then you'd check out Immortal. I mean, I don't really see the conflict there, but there are some striking similarities to black metal imagery. And to be honest, I was actually surprised when I heard Immortal Souls for the first time that they were not a black metal band, just based on the winter, the whole winter theme and all of that. It's getting cold in here just thinking about it. So, Dan... Tell me about Coal Chamber. Well, Joe, Coal Chamber is an American new metal band, or they were an American new metal band from LA. Started in 1993, featuring Des Fafara on lead vocals. Um, they've had a lot of members. Um, I don't think I'm going to list them all here because, to me, Des is kind of the kind of the main the, the main attraction for me. Uh, we, we already did an episode on Devil Driver. And now we're getting we're going back to Coal Chamber, which might be backwards a little bit, but uh, but I'm okay with it. Um, Coal Chamber is probably one of the coolest new metal bands that were out at the time. Um, very extreme vocals for that style of music. Um, at least they were very extreme to me at that time. Uh, it's kind of weird because the very first time I ever heard Dez's vocals, they like terrified me. Um, I thought that this guy was Satan. He was coming to my house. He was going to murder me. He was going to he was going to put me in a creepy ice cream truck, and then I was going to drive around and just be a dead body in the back of Sweet Tooth from Twisted Metal's truck. What's wrong that with that in 1999? I mean, nothing wrong with it other than being dead. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, with, I, within I, the era, he was. I mean, it, it was intense because I. You know what's funny is going back and listening because uh, I, I I don't listen to a ton of Cold Chamber. Uh, that was it for me. That was definitely uh, uh, an an era band. It wasn't something that stuck seminally with me. But I just remember back in the '90s, whenever I first heard their uh, self titled, just thinking, "Holy shit!" I mean, this guy is fucking crazy. And uh, it's so weird on as you grow with metal how when you go back to something like Cold Chamber, it's not nearly uh, as intimidating or as brutal as what you remembered it as. Yeah, but it's so fucking fun. The band oh, yeah. is very deliberately playing very low tune guitars and just creating rhythmic passages that are steamrolling in a ice cream truck across the audience. 
Nobody's trying to play the most complicated thing in the world, but they definitely have a tendency towards dissonance and groove. All things that I love. Yeah, I mean, they definitely had a very specific... I don't want to say formula because they their music radically changes between albums. But on this first album, they are really, really, really dialed in as far as what the fun parts and the most exciting parts of new metal are. So you've got guitars that are on par with the first Korn album, but they're a little bit faster. There's a little bit more of that like rap vocal in there, but he's just screaming it like like a crazed Kermit the Frog. Um, and it's just awesome. Like whenever I hear Loco, even to this day, I still get pumped up. Like I'm ready I'm ready to go throw some cars after after listening to Loco. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, Cold Chamber is a, uh, especially on the first album, uh, it, for me, it's kind of a gimmick and shock value, but I'm fine with it. I mean, there's sometimes with gimmick bands, I I don't think there's not any substance behind it, but they uh, they found their niche and they they, they went through it, they went and, and nailed it. It's kind of like how I, when I was uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s, I kind of thought of them the same way I did Marilyn Manson. And the fact that there was more to it than just the look and the shock factor, there was good music that was in behind it uh, that you could really just have fun with. And that... I think that was the. Uh, I think that's the reason why I. It was the first new metal album I bought. Actually, was their self-titled. I'm 99% sure this is the first record I listened to where I was consciously aware of how many times the band was saying "fuck." Just listening <laughs> to Sway because that was the first song I heard by Cold Chamber. I knew that opening riff, as it were, the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. I don't know where I knew it from, but I fucking knew it. It was like Freddy Krueger. You've never seen it, but you know who that character is. Dude, it sounds like Freddy Krueger singing. I never made that connection before, but that's totally what it sounds like on this record. <laughs> I keep saying Kermit the Frog, but it definitely sounds like Freddy Krueger, like Robert England's. Uh, Freddy Krueger right. uh, doing, Freddy doing lead vocals. We're not talking about anybody else because Robert England is is Freddy the Krueger. only one. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yours was Sway. Mine was radically different as far as my first exposure, and it was mainly because uh, this is going to sound crazy, but it was uh, my best friend's little sister who had this album first when I was in high school. And it was uh, a mirror of the desert. That was the first thing that, I, that I've ever Fucking heard. Fucking a mirror of the desert, dude. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was playing it over and over again, and I could hear her uh, while we were in the basement and we were playing pool at his house. I could hear his little sister upstairs going. I'm like, what the fuck is going on out there? And it was a mirror of the desert. I'm like. What the fuck is this band? All right, I got to check this out. I think this is going to be another Il Nino situation where we have such fond memories of the first record. As a whole, it's a front to back. Every song is good. It's not the most amazing record, but I always remember Dan being in a bad mood. He doesn't want to listen to anything except whatever ridiculously obscure black metal he has in his CD case. <laughs> and I would say. Sneak... Are you talking about yesterday? <laughs> And I would sneak the Cold Chamber CD in and quickly move it to the last track. And before he got pissed off that I took over the stereo, he got a big smile on his face and just started piggy squealing because <laughs> a pig squeal makes every Dan Terry feel better. <laughs> I mean, okay, I do love this first album from a very nostalgic standpoint. I still like the riffs. They rem they remind me of the first Corn album. Sorry, the pig sounds are in my ears. <laughs> it's very distracting. <laughs> Uh, but uh, here, here's the thing. Like, this is such a product of its time that it is very hard for me to appreciate it now in 2020, which is not the point of the show. I mean, the fact that I listened to it and I enjoyed it as a youth um, is, is is totally cool. Like, Loco blew me away. Um, Big Truck was awesome. Sway is cool, but Sway is so, like, every time somebody's like, yeah, Cold Chamber, all they play is Sway. I'm like, there's better Cold Chamber songs than this. There's better Cold um, Chamber records than this. I just have fond memories for it. Well, and that's what I'm getting at. Like, to be honest, as much as I love Dez and I love Dez in Devil Driver, his vocals just sound really dumb in 2020 on this record. Like, just, I, I, don't, I don't know how else to put it, but like, it just sounds goofy to me now. Whereas back then it sounded brutal and raw or whatever. 
Um, but then like you start listening to somebody like George Corpse Grinder Fisher and there's just like no comparison. I know I just that's totally unfair to compare like a new metal vocalist to a death metal vocalist, but like I feel like Dez had drawn a lot of inspiration from more extreme vocals to kind of come up with this and kind of kind of melded it with new metal. And it comes across as like it, I mean, it doesn't even it doesn't even sound tough. It just sounds hilarious. Yeah, I don't it, know how to explain it. Like it's not brutal. It doesn't hit you. You don't take it seriously now. But in '97, it was a way different story. Yeah, a lot of the uh, harsh, quote unquote, harsh vocals in this sound more like the drunk dude at the baseball game yelling at the umpire that he sucks. Yeah, he's trying to, or he's trying to sing "Corns Blind" on a karaoke machine, and he's like super drunk. Yeah, like it's so, just it's very strange. So me every weekend is what you're saying. <laughs> it's pretty much like the story of Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's think about it in the 1997 context. The record came out. It has that 90s dry production that I'm very much a fan of. It's some of the heaviest music that is recorded basically to tape. I don't think anybody went in with a computer and fucked with this record. I think these are the songs the band had, and this is what they did. But what was Dez's stage persona at the time? He was that grinning guy with the weird goth makeup, and they all wore all black. Meigs is over there with his giant guitar with two heavy bass strings on it. But the band was that 90s, look at us, we're dark, we're weird, we're funny, we're goofy. I don't think Dez set out to make a goofy sound. I think he just kind of adapted to the sound he was able to make. And he gets a lot of credit for it. And it definitely got better later, but we're about to get to chamber music, so... Yeah, it. I, before we move on to chamber music, it, you're, you're right. The, the, it is a... Uh, this is like one of those... Um, I don't know, as far as like uh, heavy music at that time in 97, I, I would say the Cold Chamber was probably uh, the most accessible as far as uh, heavy music was concerned. It, it, was, uh, it was the heaviest music that got the broadest audience, if that makes any sense. I agree. It, and so that's the reason why I think they uh, there's such a... Uh, uh, it's not a stigma, but I mean, it's just everybody goes back to this album because it was the first thing that, you know, holy shit, this was heavy and it was played on the radio. I think that's really what it was more than anything else because it was kind of like it took corn and turned it up to 11 because you know lo at least here in the st louis area loco got played a lot on yeah, the, lo yeah, on the local station and in 97 loco was you know it, w it was almost taboo for for radio i mean it was like holy shit this is fucking crazy for you know because at the same time we're listening to you know live and back and then the next song is <laughs> is cult chambers loco i mean you're like what the fuck i mean so it, w it was pretty cool for for that aspect of it and it, they really did help um allow harder music to become more popular because uh they were the first ones that i that i can remember that were really heavy that wasn't hair metal uh i mean i don't think necessarily ha hair metal is heavy but you kind of get my idea i'm talking about like uh like the 80s metal in general uh, this was like the next wave of heavy that finally pushed through. And I just, it just, and it could just be my memory, but Loco just sticks out, you know, in particular uh, because of the, the uh, large amounts of radio play it got. And I think that was, uh, that was an important thing for me uh, at the time, uh, hearing it and remembering it and realizing how uh, how much I enjoyed heavier music and the fact that it was finally becoming more accessible because it, at the time in the Midwest, you know, we had lots of cool music, but mostly it was uh, the heaviest stuff that we got tend to be more uh, industrial in nature. And this was just more, you know, it was, well, it was new metal. I mean, it was the first time that we really had stuff played on the radio that sounded more like what I would want to listen to in my own record collection. This was grunge for thrash metal fans. I don't know. I, I don't know if I follow you on that one, but uh, I, I mean. Explain. Yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> curious what you're uh, I'm, I'm actually saying this is more of the 
it bridges that gap from the 80s thrash that got played on the radio, like the Me- Metallica and the Megadeths. And then, you know, of course, that same time there was hair metal, you know, hair bands out. And then grunge kind of just completely took over. And this was like the next step to back to heavy. And as a teenager for me at the time, this was it was super important for me because it was something new that I got to connect with it, it, to say that it was my own. I couldn't say the same thing about older Metallica and Megadeth because that was my friend's older brother's music kind of thing. Does that make sense? Well, I think that that statement wouldn't just apply to just Cold Chamber. I mean, I think that that kind of is new metal in general at that time was was kind of that bridge between, you know, you because you've on one side of the fence you've got you've got '90s alternative rock that never i mean wasn't wasn't quite dead by then like it was dead but people didn't know it was dead um and new metal was kind of stepping up as the extreme music because i think yeah everybody got super burned out with 80s bands hair bands especially those died out early in the early 90s uh and everybody everybody kind of stopped paying not everybody but the mainstream stopped paying attention to metal overall um even the biggest metal bands like megadeth or metallica were not necessarily playing metal they were adopting more to that hard rock style that everybody seemed to favor in the early 90s. And then Korn comes out with their record and everything kind of changes and people are like, okay, I could do metal because compared to 80s hair metal, this this stuff actually seems very serious and very um, very relevant uh, to the time. But I think that's new metal in gen- general, not just Cold Chamber, because I'll say it, I don't really think Cold Chamber is a very original band. Uh, no, they're I think not. They're, I think their first album borrows very much from corn and i agree i agree but i think i I guess the point that i'm trying to make uh and maybe i will try to make a couple analogies corn is more like the the metallica whereas the you know they're they're more mainstream and they're very very popular and i guess i kind of looked at uh at the time i'm not saying i look at it now but at the time i kind of looked at cold chambers more like the the slayer or they were the heavier version of of new metal just kind of like how slayer was the heavier version of of thrash back then does that make sense makes sense and it kind of bridges the gap too because i i've got and this is my own personal categor categorization for new metal there's the i i call them there's rock based new metal bands and then there's like extreme new metal bands so you've got on the rock based ones that would be like your corn your disturbed your limp biscuit your Lincoln Parks, you know, bands like that. Um, and then I would call your extreme new metal bands like your Slipknot, your Mudvayne, uh, Il Nino, bands like that that were just kind of a little bit more next level. And uh, Devil Driver is kind of a bridge between those two levels, I feel. Uh, you mean I Devil you? Driver. I Devil Driver <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm going to do, do that a lot in this episode, and I apologize. Um, but Cold Chamber was kind of the bridge between those two levels, in, in my opinion. Um, and, and you're right. And the, you know, it's funny that you say that because the next thing that I, uh, after I started really enjoying uh, Cold Chamber, the next two things that she showed me, one was Kitty and the other was Slipknot. Oh, you guys talked about Kitty, huh? Yeah, she, you know, that was the crazy thing. She was the younger sister, but she fucking loved metal back in the day. And it was awesome. Uh, I kind of sort of might have dated her after that, but <laughs> that's besides the point. Uh, you know, hey, great minds think alike. So I, I, I had to get more. And then it turned out that the little brother was a huge Slipknot fan and went out and got a, a, a drum kit for the next Christmas after that. But yeah, it you're right. It's not the heaviest thing out there, but it was the heaviest thing that was on the radio, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and that's that, fair. And, 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 that was, and that was super, super important for me at that time as being an impressionable teenager hearing something that i could relate to that was heavier being played on the radio really meant a lot to me so i i immediately went out and i i bought that album for myself shortly thereafter listening to uh my best friend's little sister's uh copy of that i think what you're saying jeff is cold chamber was a band that subdivided a group of subdividing new metal fans I don't think they were the heaviest band in the room. They were like Tenacious D in a way. At a corn show, you've got corn, Limp Biscuit, maybe you've got Sepultura playing Roots, but then Cold Chamber runs in and goes, boo! Like, they had a mystique that they were heavier, even though they were technically not any different than anybody else in the room. 
but nobody sounds like Dez. They were the heaviest thing that was played on the radio at the time. That was that's more what I'm just trying to say, and that was important to me. Just because uh, back then, you know, internet really was it was just dial up. There was no you know file sharing services, so there wasn't Napster yet. So it was that was the reason why hearing heavy music on the radio to me was so important because. Other than going to the music store and just, you know, looking at cool album covers and finding out, well, that looks brutal. Let's listen to that. And then you find out that it's just a bunch of Yngwie Malmsteen bullshit, you know, which sometimes I like. But the radio is how you found your music. I mean, that's just kind of how it was. I remember listening here in St. Louis, this radio station called The Point. Uh, KPNT, they're still around, but they used to have what, what was called New Music Sundays. And it was awesome because you would get to hear new stuff that you normally wouldn't hear on regular, you know, top 40 or alternative rock radio. And then hearing stuff like Cold Chamber show up was just, it was mind blowing for a, a teenage kid who loved metal. It was, it was super cool because it was just something that you didn't expect. And it, it made me a fan. Did you feel the same way in 1999 when Chamber Music came out? I did. Uh, I actually, I think this is bar none Pull Chamber's best album. I don't even think it's remotely close. Over time, I have come to appreciate this record. I had an unreasonable aversion to it back then. I think it just didn't sound the same, and I didn't fully process the subtle improvements, and I was extremely attached to the previous record songs because they were all fucking good. But Chamber Music, I think, is the best Cold Chamber record for the band that we remember. Rivals might be a technically superior record, but this has the best songs that the band ever wrote and put together. And some I of the agree. most interesting choices. Not I talking agree. about the cover song. <laughs> no, because I, I, quite frankly, I think it's the worst song on the album. I, I, I don't particularly care for the cover. I, but that's just me. I mean, I, I really... This is when you actually start to get more of... Uh, one thing that doesn't get... I don't think it's recognized very much is that Dez has a beautiful bass slash baritone voice. Whenever he's in the lower registers, the dude can fucking sing. I'm like, you know, this was the time of crash test dummies and shit. I'm like, let's get some more of that. Uh, that's, I love, um, I love that that contrast because his, whenever he's uh, he's, this is whenever he really starts to get more of the vocal fry in his screams too, and less Kermit and uh, or Freddy, uh, whatever you want to call it. So I, I actually like the fact that uh, you get that that massive contrast of the baritone with the with the vocal vocal fry screams. I, I think is super cool, and I wish that there was more of that in music because, as we already know, I love contrast in music, especially if you can do it within the same song. It's just super cool to me. Chamber music's really interesting. It is a very fun, dynamic, diverse record. Which makes it sound like I'm just gonna just throw rainbows all over it. Um, I think tragedy is an amazing opener, uh, and you, it goes immediately in. It, they, they don't they don't throw on a song like Loco or something or Big Truck or something at the beginning of it to make you think, oh, it's the same. There's no transition between this album and the first uh, Cold Chamber album. And I love tragedy so much because as soon as they start playing. We're we're out of corn country and we've gone into like white zombie, Rob Zombie territory, but you've got like these kind of almost John Davisy vocals going over it. It's different hearing clean, clear, hearing a clean voice from Dez, uh, and I love that. I love it mixed with the screams and, and, and all of that. Um, Tragedy is an amazing song. I do think that it writes a check that the rest of the album can't cash, but. Um, like I, as an album opener, I used to just listen to that over and over and over and over again. I mean, there's an intro called Mist, but I mean, whatever. Um, but yeah, Tragedy is 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 the is the best album opener. But as I as I listen to it though now, what I'm getting from it is that like it reminds me a lot of an album that came out before this, a uh, year before this, and that would be Corn's Fall the Leader. Um, they had a lot of because if you if you look at Corn's transition from the self titled and Life Is Peachy, where the cell, that's where the first Devil Driver album draws a lot of its inspiration, uh, at least musically. 
this record follows the trend that Corn followed whenever they hit Follow the Leader. So if they're okay, I've talked myself into some kind of weird pun thing. Uh, <laughs> but basically, like to me, this record sounds more like Follow the Leader. Like they are, they are just taking a cue from Corn. And um, like, because you listen to Untrue, uh, that song's very Corn Follow the Leader ish, using a lot of a lot of similar. Uh, guitar effects there's a lot of guitar effects all over this but it still has the new metal chunk it still has the screams it still has the intense parts um and it's not a direct rip off of father leader but what i think is interesting is that the band did a lot of press on this record saying that like we're intentionally trying to distance ourselves from bands like corn and limp biscuit and stuff like that but then when you listen to this record it, it's still very much that um they've just thrown in like a little bit of like new wave stuff like with the keyboards and and stuff like that um but like riffs wise you're still you're still in lip biscuit territory not lip biscuit uh but corn territory and it's just weird to me because i feel like they were trying to do something really original here but kind of failed or the other bands around them were kind of having the same musical um collected mindset you know collective um, thinking great minds yeah. think alike whatever you want to call it yeah, so like I don't know, like it's a mixed bag for me. Um, really, I, I the one thing I that I I did discover about myself and my uh, my pursuit of uh, of inner peace is that I'm a new metal fan and I'm okay with that. <laughs> nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, man. I'm new glad you've cool come again. to terms with yeah, this I, for yourself, Jeff. Yeah, but it, it's kind of like what what Dan's talking about. I. I like the whenever he said there's you know there's the rock new metal and then the metal side of new metal, the metal side of new metal and then like the industrial side of new metal like Spine Shank like just listen to that shit all day long and, and fucking love it and and I don't apologize about it and I roll the windows down and make sure the person at the stoplight next to me gets to hear the same fucking thing I'm listening to, I love it now I I do have a hard time doing that with. Uh, with the Limp Biscuits and the Linkin Parks of the world. That's just not quite what I'm looking for personally, but the heavier side of new metal is uh, I, I think I will take that to, to my grave with me. I just, I like that kind of feel. I think the chamber music is is pretty dynamic. Uh, is Does it sound like a lot of other new metal bands at the time? Well, yeah. they A lot of them all <laughs> sounded a lot alike. Absolutely. But I'm okay with it. I like, um, to me, the biggest difference uh, is Dez's voice. He, he does, within the metal scene at this time, has a very unique voice. You can immediately tell when it's Dez, even if he's doing different things with his voice, uh, as far as like, you know, whenever he's singing clean down low in his register, it's the tonality of it is still Dez. It's still easy to pick out that that's who it is. So for me, I, I do enjoy it, and which is which is really bizarre because I used to, outside the gimmicky side of Cold Chamber at one point, I kind of poo-pooed them a little bit. But the the only one of their albums that I still listen to on a regular basis is Chamber Music. Uh, it just it just right thing at the right time for me for whatever reason. Because uh, I think I bought this and uh, LD50 at the same time. Good choice. And Weird pairing. Well, yeah. Well, I knew one. I saw the music video for Dig, so I was like, fuck, dude, this music video is awesome. I'm going to check out the rest of it. But yeah, it was um, it was awesome. I, I it was just it was the right thing at the right time. It, it, it struck me. It struck me uh, just the right way. And even if it doesn't hold up, I, I think it, the other thing, too, is it holds up. It holds up a lot more than their self title does. And I think that's partly the maturation of uh, Dez's vocals. Uh, it, there's less, uh, you know, jazz hands and more substance uh, this go around. And, and I and I think that he's been working with somebody to figure out how to how to properly scream to, and then you know you know pairing that with the with the with the cleans that he he starts to provide on this one. I really did. I really enjoyed it, and I and I still enjoy it. I definitely agree he was working on his voice. This record to me sounds like the band that made Cold Chamber sat down and really tried to write and record and release a serious record. A serious record in 1999, 
might be a new metal record, but you hear their influences. You hear the effort being put into the songs. I remember a few interviews written in, let's be honest, it was 99, it was probably Guitar One or Guitar World, where the story with Coal Chamber was the band doesn't get along, they don't write anything together, and that's basically the whole story. But then you listen to the record and you think, this sounds like that band put a lot of time into putting this record together. I think a lot of the history of Coal Chamber is tied to the story of Dez. And I'm very much simplifying. Dez started in Coal Chamber. He wanted to do more. So Devil Driver appeared. And then a few years later, I'm jumping ahead. Coal Chamber comes back for a little bit. And then Dez says, yeah, guys, you know what? Never mind. I think at this point in Coal Chamber, Dez is trying to go further with this idea that he has about what heavy music should be, or at least the music that he wants to create. And that's not the clowning, new metal, punk rock thing from the first record. It's, no, guys, we can write some melody. It'll be fine. Even though I'm Dez and I'm going to at the mic, we can still we can still do other things. Yeah, I think it's it's a strong record. I think it's a sweet spot record for me. In that I'm not going to just pull it out. Like, if I want to listen to a record that sounds like this from this time period, I'm probably going to go with Follow the Leader first. But when that record's over, I'm going to listen to chamber music because it, it, you know, Follow the Leader had kind of set a precedence for complicated new metal, like new metal that drew different influences from all kind of musical spectrum. And so with this record, they are more diverse. It's much more digestible. It's much more listenable than the self-titled is. And the vocals are better. There's more diversity. Um, the songs are awesome. I honestly don't understand why this record didn't skyrocket them. Because it wasn't the gimmick anymore. That's yeah, and it wasn't corn either, you know? Bands like Cold Chamber kind of got overshadowed by bands like Corn and Limp Bizkit, especially that year. Absolutely. Well, yeah, but the, the re- yeah, the only way that they would have been able to stand out, you know, in hindsight, is to to keep with the quote unquote a shtick. They needed a shtick to to keep going because that's you know it was the shock value and the, the 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 persona that that's you know they they focused more on the substance. You know, and that's good for us, you know, because, you know, we're not, but we're not the average consumer. You know, most people who listen to to metal are a lot like us and we're album listeners. We're not, we don't need that shock. We don't need that, you know, one crazy song. We just need good music. And that's what this is. There's more good music here than what was on the, uh, their self-titled. But, you know, I get it. Whenever you do come out the uh, the same year that Corn and Limp Bizkit come out with, you know, these absolutely massive records, I, I, I get it. You know, it was the same thing with what I, I loved uh, UHF, and it came out the exact same time as Batman. And yeah. I think there was something else. There was a couple other movies. I, I think uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head, but UHF was this weird, quirky thing that was fucking great, but... Nobody saw it because everybody was going to see Tim Burton's Batman. All right, so that's kind of how I look at this. You know, that this is, you know, it's quirky. It's fun. It's really good. It's really, I think it's well thought out, but it just got, like you said, it got overshadowed, out, it got overshadowed because it didn't have that shock value that went out and uh, grabbed you because it, it, it just, you know, I don't know. I, I still like it though. I'm still probably going to listen to this more than I will uh, really anything that's uh, Limp Biscuit, you know. And I, the only thing I'm going to listen to Corn over this is going to be that dubstep album because I know how much Joe loves that. You know, I think this record is probably their best as far as it sounding the most like them. I feel like a lot of their other stuff is very derivative, which I'll get into on the next record. But I think that I think in this place in time, this was kind of Coal Chamber's moment to shine. I don't think they succeeded in their goal of standing out from their peers, but it's it's an equivalence. It's just as good as their peers, even though it's a little derivative of them. Um, but unfortunately, it's just it's just not enough to get them over the over the edge for me. I'm still gonna listen to like Significant Other or Fall Leader over this if I'm in a new metal mood. 
Um, and that's not a slam on a slam on Cold Chamber. It's just that this record. I'm trying to I'm trying to be really nice because I do like this record, but I just feel like the first record derivative, the second record diverse diverse. They tried really hard, but they were still derivative. And um, so when I'm listening to it in 2020, getting ready for the show, like it's hard not to notice that. Whereas I may have been more nostalgically attached to it when I was younger. Um, from a modern perspective, I just feel like they didn't they didn't show as much growth as it may appear. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And that's gonna become dreadfully evident on Dark Days. Are we ready for Dark Days? Yep, because everything we're gonna have to say is very dark on this one. Just like the album cover. Chamber yep. Music has a really cool cover song where Cole Chamber plays Shock the Monkey with Ozzy Osbourne doing guest vocals. I can't tell yeah, you happened. anything about that that the Roach Coach didn't already tell you. Go listen to their episode about chamber music. Spoilers. It basically happened because Sharon Osbourne was the manager of this band. Who better to have in 1999? 2002, Dark Days. This one hurts a little on bit, guys. Dark Days. Oh, wait, that's <laughs> Soundgarden. But yes, it fell on Dark Days It is how I feel about this. Just, no, not feeling it. It's it's decent. It sounds to me like it should have come out before Chamber Music. Yeah. Like, th- this, this almost sounds like the natural evolution of the first album. And they start, they still have those elements that they had in Chamber Music there. Like, they were starting, like, like if... If time worked differently than it does, this album should have come out after the first album. And then you would have seen the transition from the first album to this to chamber music. Um, and it, it's, this is, you know, I was talking about derivative. They just went back to the first Cold Chamber album. Yeah, there's some clean vocals in there. Um, it, the songs are probably more well thought out than we're giving them credit for. It but felt like a regression. Overall, it just felt like a slog. Like, I have trouble getting through it. It's one of the shorter Cold Chamber records. But for whatever reason, like, it sounds like the first album with, like, less funny vocals. But, like, the vocals on that first album are not a bug. They're a feature. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know? Whereas with this record, you, you've you got Dez being more extreme again, which, dude, there were probably tons of fans. There are probably tons of douchebags like myself they listened to the first Cold Chamber album and said it was the greatest thing that they'd ever heard put to put to put to recording, you know. And then they put out chamber music, and there were probably a bunch of people that were like, "Hey, Cold Chamber sold out because they started singing, and I didn't really into that. It's stupid, yada yada yada." And then so they throw this record on, and it's like, "Well, yeah, now they went back to being extreme, you know." And I'm yeah, I'm creating a narrative here that may or may not have actually happened, but. If I had to, if I had to take a wild guess, I feel like that's why this record was probably more focused on heaviness than than chamber music. But the diversity is almost completely gone, um, and it just seems like I don't know. It seems very phoned in to me. This is the first time that knowing the story of Dez and knowing some of the things that the magazines wrote about this band, it's hard not to just agree with that. It sounds like Dez is moving forward. It sounds like he's putting more effort into his sound, but the band isn't delivering songs that impact anymore. There's some good riffs here and there. There's Dark Days, there's Fiend, even Friend and Rowboat, because why not? Ugh. But the band just doesn't feel the same. Something's missing, and that's very strange because chamber music had something that you can't put your finger on but it's there this is missing something that in 2002 feels essential for this band to succeed and they just don't have it yeah well, i think I, this is a oh go ahead jeff sorry no i was gonna say i think this is just kind of a uh, a foreshadowing you know that we know that this band is going to be defunct you know minus their you know, the, the, the slight comeback, you know that it's pretty clear that Dez is going to be moving on in you know, what she does, but that it, it, it just doesn't uh, like it, it's it's like Joe said, it's missing something. It, there's something there that's just not grabbing you like like it should, uh, because Dez does have a unique vocal set, uh, especially within um, this this time frame. You know, he's he um well it's not really unique anymore there's more and more people starting to sound like him by this point but you could just tell that the dude has more to give vocally and he's gonna move on to something else yeah that that's really what i got out of it yeah i mean i think 
for fans, you know, it's widely regarded as their heaviest album, you know, super in your face. But, you know, I think I think the whole bag of tricks idea that we've kind of come up with on this show. Um, Devil Driver was no, not Devil Driver. Uh, Coal Chamber was composed <laughs> of was composed of like a certain amount of elements. And they only took a few of the elements out of the bag for the first record. And then they pulled all this other stuff out of the bag for chamber music. But now the bag's empty. And so all <laughs> they have is that is, is those same elements again. So it's like, how do we mix these same elements again together and make it interesting? And it's also worth noting that, you know, Devil Driver was playing a show. I don't remember where it is or where it was, but basically um, their guitarist hits Dez in the face with his guitar. And then Dez got pissed off and walked off stage and then came back out and was like, yep, this is our last show, guys. And that was basically it for Coal Chamber. Like, um, and I mean, I'm sure that one incident wasn't like why the band broke up, but it was the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, so to speak. It was um, obviously th there was a lot of tension. There, there's tons of tension. You can read all about this online. Like um, the band really had a lot of trouble getting along um, and it just all culminated in that one show and and i can see it and and stuff like that also like i feel like a band that believes in their future and believes in their success would try to work it out but whenever your whenever your last record's called dark days and i i don't necessarily know if the band was 100 percent happy with this record and so i don't know i just feel like cold chamber was kind of on its last leg here anyway and i think that reflects in the sound of the record it's kind of like a defeatist attitude that's kind of what I feel listening to it. It's just like, yep, this is it. Good night, everybody. Yeah, it'll be like <laughs> pretty much. Our, it'll be us on like episode. <coughs> excuse me. It'll be us on like episode seven hundred and ninety-four of discography discussion. And then one day, Jeff just throws the headphones down and says, "I'm out. We're done. This I mean it this time." <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, this should have been the last. Uh, I almost did it. <laughs> I almost said Devil Driver. Thanks, Dan, for making me do that. Uh, this should have been the Devil last. Devil Driver's just a better band. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You you are 100 percent correct. But this should have been the last Cold Chamber album, no question. I I agree 100. percent So like it was for a long time, and then 2013, 14 ish, we started to see bands that haven't played together in a while just decide to play a show and coal chamber played a show thank you to the glorious youtube for providing a camera of that from somebody in the audience but it sounded like coal chamber i was excited i thought this is awesome there's no reason why a band who did a good job entertaining fans and having a persona even if that persona was new metal in nature can't just get back together and play a show but then we all started to notice that new metal was kind of cool again for some of us it never stopped being cool people just stopped talking about it for a few years 2015 coal chamber puts out rivals the opening song is called i owe you nothing it sounds like coal chamber but Dez is so far beyond what was vocally necessary for a Cold Chamber record <laughs> that it stands out like a sore thumb. You just have to accept the fact that the band sounds like Cold Chamber, but Dez sounds like Dez. And Dez in 2015 is not the same vocalist he was when he was in Cold Chamber on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure that hardcore fans of this band are excited, but it's like when Ozzy Osbourne came back to sing for Black Sabbath, not talking about the 13 record, talking about the reunion show, where he kind of still had the voice, but he sounded like Ozzy from the 80s, so it's not the same band. And the vocalist, who is arguably the center point of the band from the majority of the fan perspective, is not the same vocalist. So you're either here for Dez or you're disappointed in my eyes. I'm I'm disappointed, and that's mainly because uh, 
Des is so far beyond the band at this point in time. It just doesn't fit anymore. He's such a, uh, at this point, has become such a badass, brutal vocalist that it just doesn't, for me, it just doesn't work. Uh, that's that's the best way for me to put it. It's just like, it. he sounds out of place. It, it, he, it, he needs to be singing with a band that's infinitely harder with the music that is being played, then I realize, oh shit, yeah, he normally is. It's this band called Devil Driver. <laughs> why they why they did this Cold Chamber album? I don't, I don't know where don't, it came from. I want to believe that it was just a group of people who decided they didn't want to hang out anymore, decided they wanted to hang out again. Yeah, I mean, it, if it mended fences, you know, and it, everybody's all chummy chummy, buddy buddy now, I mean, that's cool. I mean, if it helped them do that, because I don't know, I don't, I didn't look into the backstory on this one uh, to see if they're still uh, a okay. But I don't think they are. Oh no, okay. You got, no. you got some insight on that. Well, a little bit of insight. I mean, it's just hearsay or whatever. But like, okay, let's follow this timeline a little bit here. Okay, so in 2011, they decide to get back together because let's be honest, there were probably fans that you know how many how many Devil Driver shows does he play where people are like, yeah, man, I, I've been listening to you ever since you know I was into Cold Chamber. You hear that so many times, you start getting nostalgic feelings. You start thinking, you know what? I haven't talked to those guys in forever. Let's reach out. Let's do it. You know, so they reform the band and they play a couple of shows and the vibes are good for the most part. Um, they, they, they continue on for a couple of years, reformed before even, you know, putting out anything or talking about putting out music. Um, at that point, it's a legacy act going going out and, and playing shows and playing all the classics and you get to hear Des scream loco, and it's great, you know, right? Um, they end up signing to a record label in 2013, and they announce Rivals. They even get Al Jorgensen to do guest vocals on one of their songs. Um, everybody's happy, right? Uh, but I guess they're not, because by, like, literally a year after the album came out, uh, Des does an interview where he's like, yeah, Cold Chamber, indefinite hiatus. And um, they're like, oh, why? And he says, oh, it's because Devil Driver's, like, really taken off here. But then he turns around later and says, yeah, this band, Cold Chamber has no place in my life whatsoever at this point. That's a d direct quote. Damn. <laughs> because, you know, he quit the band way back then because like, oh, I hate these guys. They're ter I can't, uh, I would never spend any time with these people ever again. And then you get nostalgic, you go back, you guys become friends. But after a while, you're like, wait a minute, I hate these people. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's a reason why I left the first time around. Exactly. And rediscovering it. Yep. And, and let's be honest, for the most part, he was the band. He was the reason I was there. You know, um, he could have, he, Des very easily could have hired new musicians and continued on as Cole Chamber indefinitely. He could have put out the Devil Driver albums as Cole Chamber. You know what I mean? It would have been probably fine. Um, it'd be a very different discussion if that were the case. But, um, this record just comes off sounding like, you know, like you guys have said, Des is so above and beyond vocally. Dude, you know, probably 10 years prior to this coming out, Des went full metalcore and never looked back. And it, best decision ever because he was, he was great for it. You, you couldn't think of anybody else that could pull it off like he could pull it off. And so this record comes across as like, it's like if Devil Driver released, or no, I guess the best way to say it, it's going to sound really, really dumb and basic, and I apologize. But instead of it being a Cold Chamber reunion, it's a Cold Chamber reunion, but they got the dude from Devil Driver to do vocals. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think that's... that's like, I, I realize that's that perfect. sounds really stupid and dumb and basic, but like, there's a lot of truth to it because he's no longer he like he in a certain sense he doesn't identify anymore as cold chamber does right you listen to the first cold chamber record chamber music and you hear that vocalist who became someone else in a different band and you can't go back when you get that good sometimes so it's not going to sound the same to get back to the record, though, I don't think this is a total loss. I think I would definitely like it better than, than uh, Darkest Days or Dark Days, you know, but like because it's got modern production, it's a little bit heavier. I mean, it's, uh, it does in a certain sense sound how Cold Chamber would sound now. But part of the appeal of Cold Chamber for me is the nostalgia, the time period when I first heard the band. Um, and again, this is this is totally unpleasable metal fan territory here. Ladies and but, gentlemen, unpleasable metal fan. But I mean, I like Cold Chamber because they were an old band from the late 90s, early 2000s. And so to hear a new record from them didn't have the effect 
on me that maybe it probably should have. Um, I do think they tried. They did spend a lot of time on it and in all of that. But again, Des outshines the rest of the band um, ridiculously. And um, it's hard to call it a return to form because musically, I think it picks up from Dark Days and it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more metal. I like I, I definitely love the modern sheen on it and everything. But like, I don't love this record. Like, I don't ever listen to it because you get I don't know. Can you guys identify with this? You get to like the end of the bridges you burn and you're like, OK, I'm going to go listen to Devil Driver now. No, I I think what it is, it's uh, I I call it the time capsule effect. Cold Chamber is a band that is best when it's within that time capsule of the 90s. So anything that's outside of that era, whenever you go back and listen to their music, you're like, well, that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, and they they really, I, I think they really reflect that more than some of the other bands that, that we've covered on um, saying that, yes, this is exactly what we're looking for. We don't want anything else from them because normally we, we do like the, the branching out, but they're there wasn't really any branching out. It was just more like you said, they, it was a modern sheen on a 90s sound. And yeah. there, there was nothing different about it other than the fact that you realize that Dez is a beast and is better than what everything else around him is. And so it was just, a, it, I think it was not needed uh, personally. Uh, but I'm sure there's fans out there that were super stoked. But I'm, I think I'm in the same camp that you know dan and probably you are too joe is that at this point i don't really i don't want i didn't want any more cold cold chamber i wanted devil driver because i think that's what fit what des was at the time because like we said des is the focal point uh in both of these bands and he's he's devil driver des now he's not cold chamber des and it just it doesn't work anymore yeah, because, I mean, he's been Devil Driver Dez longer than he was Cold Chamber Dez. Exactly. You know what I mean, it's at this point, and this never happens with, like, legacy singers like this. You know, like, everybody remembers Ozzy from Black Sabbath to keep it, you know, topical, right? I and mean, everybody likes Ozzy's solo stuff, too, or whatever. But, like, people still like the old concept of it being, you know, Black Sabbath. Um, Dez is unique in the sense that he was in two successful bands. But his identity is so much tied to, he, to in me, to me, he's no longer, Devil Driver is no longer that band that like features the dude that used to be in Cold Chamber. I mean, it is that, but in my mind, it's like Cold Chamber is some old band that Dez from Devil Driver used to sing for. Yeah, kind of like how, you know, <laughs> it, Justin Timberlake's a superstar. What's this? In, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, no, that, that's a good comparison too, though. Yeah, I would actually the the ones that when you were saying it, it, it they're a prog rock band at the time. But what would really um, I would say that I when you said that it really struck me the most was actually uh, especially Peter Gabriel with Genesis, but also a little bit of Phil Collins in Genesis as well. Uh, it in with especially with Phil Collins going back and doing Genesis work after you know as well as the solo stuff. But, you know, people don't think of Genesis anymore when you say Phil Collins. They think of Phil Collins. Right. I mean, there's a lot of times with the stuff that he did when he went back and did with Genesis. If people started, went online and started looking for his, the music, they would be typing in looking for Phil Collins and not for Genesis. Right. But 2020 ears know the difference. You can listen to the Genesis that came out after Phil Collins' solo record, and it still sounds like Genesis. Yeah. I think Cold Chamber is an example of a classic new metal band who did not survive the era. And in 2015, when the general populace decided that new metal was okay again, they could not deliver a record that, for lack of a better phrase, that we enjoyed. I mean, we had My Ticket Home doing Strangers Only, which was basically a new metal record two years prior. And what were we going to get in a few years? I think it's because the, it, Des was no longer a, a new metal singer. I mean, that's really what it came down. I think if, if Des would have done the old school Cold Chamber vocals instead of, you know, the Devil Driver 
metalcore vocals. Uh, it might have been a different thing. Uh, he, I think he I don't, tried though. Yeah, it listen, just right. yeah, it just didn't work. It just it just didn't. He can't. It's he was as weird as it sounds. It's almost like he has to bring himself down a level quality wise to make it work for the type of music that's being played. If that makes any sense at all. But he still didn't come down. He can't. That's my point. Final thoughts on Cold Chamber. Jeff. For the 90s, within a time capsule, as I've said already, first two albums are one is fun, the other is great. So their self-titled is just a lot of fun. It's weird as fuck. The, you know, it's one of those things. It's kind of like um, Pig Destroyer whenever the first time that you played somebody, Jennifer. It's the exact same thing with Cold Chamber and Pig. Like you play that song and, because you're like, dude, check this out. I mean, because you're just like, it's so different than what you were exposed to at the time. You're like, what the? F this is fucking awesome because this is so weird and unexpected. Uh, but yeah, and I, chamber music is just uh, hit me in the feels at the right time, right place. I think it's a, a complete record. There's a lot of dynamics in it. Thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, but outside of that, uh, I'm super happy that Des moved on and ended up in Devil Driver. Uh, that's that's pretty much how I feel about it. I wish they had not had not did not make that fourth album. Damn, what about you? I like Cold Chamber. I really do, and I know I probably didn't come across that way on on this episode, and I apologize for that. Um, but I just after a while, I man, I get so used to just calling a spade a spade and kind of seeing kind of seeing what it really is beyond beyond my nostalgia for it. Um, I love the first two records. Uh, I could have done without the last two for sure. Um, I'm a huge Devil Driver fan, so pretty much anything I have to say about about Cold Chamber is going to be tainted by that. Um, I even switched my music over from Cold Chamber to Devil Driver halfway through the episode. Um, you know, it's not an act of protest. I just think that like he had a cool thing going with Cold Chamber. It fit the time. They're a band that we all remember because of the craziness of the Loco video and the craziness of his vocals at that time. But I just don't think that they're a band that ever really took off. Um, I mean, they had moderate success because they were playing a style of music that was popular at the time. Um, but I think as a band with longevity and a huge career, they just never had that. And um, unfortunately, you know, you pretty much do pretty well just listening to chamber music. And because there are some cool, there are some cool things on there. Um, Shock the monkey, notwithstanding. Um, I mean, check out Devil Driver if you're looking for an, a cool throwback. But just listen to chamber music. I like the memory of Cole Chamber. They're a band that put out more than one record that I look back on fondly because it was something different at a time when music was changing and people were already starting to fall into their little cliches. It was intense, it was heavy, and it had a style that Although derivative of other bands, nobody really sat down and tried to make a Coal Chamber record except Coal Chamber. So for the first record, Chamber Music, you should be listening to Coal Chamber. I don't think the last two records pull off the same feeling. One of them does try. But if you're listening to Coal Chamber for Dez, you've already moved on to Devil Driver. And I think that's okay because he has ascended past what he originally did for Cold Chamber. Dan, what's your album of the week? My album of the week is uh, Testament, obviously. <laughs> Titan of Creation. It's like a duh. <laughs> Still, yeah, I mean, this is, I, I mean, that one, dude, and we already talked about it on Patreon, but like, it's better than Brotherhood of the Snake. Jeff, what about you? I'm going to disappoint Dan. Testament is not my album of the week. Well, that's all right. I'm used to you being wrong. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not wrong this time. I, I went back a few more years, uh, actually, what, almost 15 years. Uh, Above the Weeping World by Insomnia. Okay, I'll take it. All right, good. For me, it's my ticket home, Strangers Only, because it's New Metal May, and that is an example of a band who does new, new metal very, very well. Yeehaw. Take us out, DFT. 
If you've ever been listening to this show and thought to yourself, man, why are they talking about new metal bands? I thought this was a metal show. It's only in May. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Keep sending us your band suggestions. And uh, here's a few ways you can do that. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Facebook under Discography Discussion. You can talk to us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. You can even talk to us on our Discord server. We'll have a link in the show notes that you can click on, and it'll take you right to that server where you can talk to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, not just us, really, but, you know, all, all the wonderful folks that make up that community. You can always join the Discography Discussion official group on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, you can reach out to us anytime. We're, we're around. And as long as we're awake, we'll probably answer. And on that note, this has been episode 168 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things Discography Discussion. And please, send questions and comments to Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Give me your money. Hey, you sound like Dez on the first Colt Chamber album. (laughs) (laughs) Loco. (laughs) I'm sure these kills you fine.